All right, this is going to be a follow-up for Study Rightly Divine the Word of Truth, Nine Things You Should Know. And if you have not seen that video yet, I strongly encourage that you go and watch that seven minute video because this video is going to build upon that. And I'm going to be sharing some Bible verses with you. And, you know, it's for you to consider, receive it, or reject it, whatever you decide to do with it, it's entirely up to you. All Scripture is given by inspiration to God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And the prophecy of the Scripture came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, God wrote this book, man didn't. 2 Timothy 2.15 is the only verse in your entire Bible that tells you how to study it. And Paul instructs Timothy to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to present to you today a side-by-side -side comparison of the scriptures that both the apostles Peter and Paul were commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ to teach. Same God, same book, different words. Now these verses may appear to contradict one another, but with the understanding of 2 Timothy 2.15, by rightly dividing the word of truth, we know which one is for our faith and obedience today, knowing which apostles ordained to be a teacher of the Gentiles, the nations, during the dispensation of the grace of God, and that is our apostle Paul. Now for the sake of time, I will highlight key phrases and words in each of the verses rather than reading the entire thing, but I strongly advise that you jot down the Bible verses and go read and compare these scriptures in your own time. Uh, better yet, underline, bold them with a micron pen that won't bleed through the pages of your Bible. Now, without further ado, here are 17 points where Peter and Paul deferred and how these so-called contradictions are resolved by rightly dividing the word of truth. First point would be ministry. In other words, who they were sent to. When we read in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus is sending out the 12 apostles, he tells them in verse 5 and 6, These twelve sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we see Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry with Peter and the eleven. He tells them, Hey, don't go in the way of the Gentiles. Saul wasn't saved until after Christ was resurrected in Acts chapter 9 and notice what it says about him Saul later being Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 15 but the Lord said unto him go thy way for he talking about Paul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel and let's read Romans chapter 11 verse 13 where Paul expounds a little bit more verse 13 in Romans chapter 11 for I speak to you Gentiles and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So pretty straightforward. Peter was told not to go into the way of the Gentiles. And Paul was told, hey, you're my chosen vessel. You're the apostle of the Gentiles. Point two, salvation. How are you saved? In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Peter is addressing the men of Israel. And he tells them in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they, Israel, heard this, they, Israel, were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Repent and be water baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see a work here. If you repent and you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he expounds in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So you've got works and you've got grace. Three would be commission. What are their marching orders? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So we see two different commissions. One was to baptize, one was not to baptize. Four is atonement. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter's addressing the men of Israel. He tells them, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So they had to repent, be water baptized, converted, so that their sins might be forgiven when Christ comes to the earth the second time. That's after this dispensation of the grace of God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11, Paul writes, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Israel's waiting, the body of Christ, we've already received it. Number five, gospel. In Galatians 2, verse 7, Paul is writing here, and he explains, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So pause, we have two gospels there. You've got the gospel of the circumcision committed to Peter, and then you've got the gospel of uncircumcision committed to Paul. Now these gospels have different names, and I want you to show you them in the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, this is when Christ began preaching his earthly ministry to Israel. He tell, it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So you got the gospel of the kingdom. Notice what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, in Christ's heavenly ministry to the church, the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You've got the gospel of the kingdom, dealing with earth, the gospel of Christ. Christ dying for everybody, not just Israel. And there's also the gospel of the grace of God in Acts 20:24 20, that Paul talks about. So it's important for you to understand two gospels, they have different names. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ. Things that are not the same are different. Six is inheritance. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He was talking to Israel there. All the books of the Bible, pretty much 80% of them dealing with earth. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, And he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, we have inheritance of earth for Israel and heaven for the church, the body of Christ. Seven is Christ's identity. In Jeremiah 23, verse 5, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In Colossians 1.18, Paul writes, and it says, And he, talking about Christ, is the head of of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So we have Christ coming as king over Israel, and we have Christ over here in Paul's epistles as the head of the church, the body of Christ. Eight is resurrection and the purpose of why he rose from the dead. In Acts 2.30, when Peter is addressing the men of Israel, it tells them, Therefore, being a prophet, regarding David, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, David, that out of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So Christ was raised from the dead, according to Peter, to sit on the throne of David, which was an earthly kingdom here on the earth in that land over in the Middle East. Now Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So Christ was raised from the dead to sit at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Two different reasons. Nine is chosen people. In Exodus 19, verse 6, it says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. So Israel was God's chosen people for the earth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, 
Paul writes, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. So you've got two different chosen people. You've got the nation of Israel, God's chosen people for the earth, and then you've got the body of Christ, God's chosen people for heaven. Ten is what program they're under. Now, Galatians chapter 4, Paul is writing here, but he's going to explain some things about Christ's earthly ministry. In Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Now, of course, we're talking about the law of Moses. So Christ was under the law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and He instructed Peter and the Twelve to keep the law and commandments. Now, Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So Peter and his ministry, they were under the law. Paul's ministry is under grace. 11 is justification. Now James, the book of James, we know that James was identified with Peter and his ministry. Just read James 1.1. 1, 1. It says to the 12 tribes which were scattered abroad. So he's addressing Israel there. And in... James chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Well, let's see what Paul has to say about justification. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And in Galatians 2, verse 16, Paul writes again, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's by the faith of Jesus Christ and his faith to carry out the will of God in his life that we're justified by. And again in Titus 3, verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So justified by works under this program here, and we're justified by the blood of Christ, the faith of Christ, and Christ's work at Calvary and what He's done for us. 12. Forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus is speaking to Peter and the eleven. He tells him, And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you of your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So in Mark chapter 11, we see this conditional forgiveness. If you forgive men's trespasses, your Father in heaven will forgive you. If you do not forgive men's trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Let's see what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So here we see this unconditional forgiveness. And since Christ, God has already forgiven you through Christ Jesus, you should forgive one another. So we have conditional forgiveness under Peter. We've got unconditional forgiveness under Paul. 13. Eternal security. There is a ton of scripture verses that we can look at when you look at the law of Moses and in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Hebrews through Revelation where there is this condition. If you endure the end, you shall be saved. If you don't, you can pretty much do the math. So I'm just going to pick out one verse. In Psalms 51, verse 11, this is the psalmist speaking, David. He says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So there was always this insecurity of losing the Holy Spirit. But when we read Paul's epistles and we read in Ephesians 1, it 13, it talks about being sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise after you heard the gospel and trusted in it and believed in it. And specifically, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it tells us that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we have this insecurity. It's unsecured over here with Peter and his ministry. And we have this eternal security that you cannot find anywhere outside Paul's epistles. 14, 
unforgivable sin. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 31, Christ taught in his earthly ministry to Israel. He tells them, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So, there's this unforgivable sin, speaking blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Now, if you recall, in Acts chapter 7, after the cross, Saul, who later became Paul, was part of that group in Israel that blasphemed the Holy Ghost. So, he was disqualified from Peter's gospel and had no hope. But... God struck him with the grace of God and gave him a message, the revelation of the mystery. And Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer? Paul talking about himself and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And Christ in his heavenly ministry through the Apostle Paul taught in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So that blasphemy, blaspheme is included in that. So you have blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. Couldn't be forgiven in this world, neither in the world to come. But you have under Paul's ministry, after the grace of God struck him, he tells us that we've been forgiven of all trespasses and what Christ did on that cross at Calvary that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. 15. Commandments. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, Jesus, said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Side note, if you don't have the right book, they take that as God out of most of the translations today. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So you had to keep the commandments in Christ's earthly ministry. That's what he taught. Notice what Jesus says through the apostle Paul in his heavenly ministry in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. So Christ abolished the law in his flesh. That's what we just read. And he, Paul explains a little bit further in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So Christ nailed the law into his flesh. So we had keeping it over here in his earthly ministry, and it's been abolished in his heavenly ministry. 16. Signs. In John chapter 4, verse 48, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders ye will not believe. So he told the Israelites that unless there were signs and wonders, Israelites are not going to believe. Jews. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul explains, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. So Jews required signs to believe. If there weren't any signs and wonders, just like Moses, look at Moses and Exodus. God led them out with signs and wonders. Christ, during his earthly ministry, did signs and wonders to be a man approved of God in the chat book of Acts. And the Peter and even Paul did all these signs and wonders when they were preaching to Jews. Why? Because Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. There is no signs and wonders today required for anyone to believe. All you need to hear is the gospel of what Christ did for you on the cross and you believe and trust in it. And last but not least, number 17, program. Now the word program is not in your Bible, but I'm going to use it to make a point, okay? And in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, 
Peter is speaking to the men of Israel, and he tells them, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So you've got prophecy. And what is prophecy? He just defined it. It's that which God has spoken since the world began through all of the mouth of all his holy prophets. Then you've got mystery. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 25. Paul writes, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Why was it a mystery? He's going to explain it to you in the next few words. Which was kept secret since the world began. So mystery Paul's epistles, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Why was it a mystery? Because all these things were kept secret since the world began. Prophecy, that which has been spoken by all the mouths of the prophets since the world began. Mystery, that which was kept secret. Pretty straightforward. And in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9, Paul writes, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Side note, you don't got the right book. They take by Jesus Christ out of that verse. Anyways, this thing has been hid in God. And what is that thing that was hid in God? It was hid that Christ would die for all of the world's sins, not just Israel's. It was a mystery that there would be no difference between Jew or Gentile today, and that God is pouring out His grace, not requiring any laws or any commandments for you to keep. Why? Because Christ fulfilled all of that in His flesh. And you simply believing in that truth and you trusting in, your, in that truth, God is going to work effectually in you to do the work of the ministry. So it's important that you need to know that the prophetic program is at a pause right now. God isn't dealing with the nation. You can read in Romans chapter 11, it talks about the fall, the diminish, the casting away of Israel. And Paul even explained to the church at Rome, saying that Israel, they are enemies for your sakes concerning the gospel. Because God is not dealing with that nation. Israel fell in the book of Acts. And in Acts 28, 28, salvation was sent to the Gentiles. And that prophecy by Hosea, talking about, Lo am I, there would come a time where God would declare Israel, not my people. God's chosen people today is the church, the body of Christ. You want to be a part of what God's doing today? Learn the mystery program. Get in those 13 epistles that Paul wrote. Study, rightly dividing the word of truth. These are just 17 points where I found in the scriptures where Peter and Paul have deferred. And if you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, you're ultimately going to take these two doctrines and you're going to mix them together. And it's going to create confusion not only for yourself, but those that are around you. And I'm speaking from experience. This is why Paul told Timothy to hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. And again, consider what I say, and the Lord will give thee understanding into all things in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. And moreover, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Sound words, sound doctrine. I want you to think about it. Sound. Have you ever listened to someone that's playing a musical instrument or they're singing and they hit a note that just is quiet off and it kind of makes you cringe on the inside? Well, that same thing happens when you take the teachings of Peter and you mix that with the teachings of Paul because they don't mix. Oil and water don't mix. Things of the law and the things of grace do not mix. God's will today is twofold. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, meaning God wants all men to be saved, number one, and number two, He wants you to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God is saving individuals today through the gospel of Christ, also known as the gospel of the grace of God, also known as the gospel of the uncircumcision, which was committed unto the apostle Paul, placing people into the body of Christ. And that gospel that Paul preached is this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. It's called the free gift in Romans chapter 5, verse 18. In other words, it's not of works that you can do, but by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9. You can't lose it. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, it tells us that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. This message is simple. The Bible doesn't have to be scary or confusing. God actually wants you to be saved and to know the truth. In Acts 16, verse 31, Paul told the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust in Him. You want more? Subscribe, like, comment, share. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.